up, everybody? My name is Mike Whitmire. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Flowcast, inactive CPA. Proud, proud to be an inactive CPA. Um, welcome to the podcast, Blood, Sweat, and Balance Sheets, the uh, show where I really talk about anything I want, but we mo- mostly focus on career development in the finance and executive space. So we bring on entrepreneurs, CFOs, various executives to help provide advice and mentorship on maximizing your career. I'm really excited for today's episode. We have Gaurav Bhattacharya on, entrepreneur and with some awesome stories. I mean, story growing up in India and then founding a company in high school that you end up selling to the government and is used for healthcare. That is absurd. Moving to the United States, you get to learn more about how to run effective one-on-ones. And then at the end of the episode, I learned something. I get schooled and I got to go think about some things and get better at it. So really appreciate Guarav coming on. I think you're going to really enjoy the episode. Guarav, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and, and tell us where you're, where you're coming from today. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, big fan of the podcast, big fan of, of your company. So excited to spend some time here. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. About me, I'm, I'm a CEO and co-founder of Involve AI. And uh, we are a platform that our mission is to make the world's companies more customer obsessed. Uh, We are very customer obsessed and we wanted to see how as engineers can we use data that companies have to help them organize all their customer data and make decisions that can help them make better products or serve their customers better. So that's what we do. Uh, We've built this. And as you can see behind me, that's kind of plug out the software. It's like a dashboard that gives you an early warning system of your customer health, uh, predicts churn um, opportunities, as well as expansion opportunities that you may have with your customers. So uh, that's what we do. That's a quick background background Uh about me. Awesome. And for those listening, so uh, Gaurav has the screenshot of their software behind him and it looks very good. I will say it's fresh looking software. So if you want to check it out, if uh, CS, you know, it sounds like you guys mostly sell to SaaS organizations. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, you're uh, building out your function. I would definitely recommend taking a look at their solution customer. I mean, track and churn, it's so important. It's obviously such a huge part of a business. So, mm-hmm. and how long have you been working on this? Uh, for this particular bi- so segment of the business, about a year now. But I've been doing startups for about 10 years now. This is my second company. Um, so so f- I feel like a veteran. Yeah, no, you, you you have some wild <laughs> stories. Let's just take it from the top. So I heard about uh, some high school. But let's, let's go all the way to the back. Tell us where you grew up, your story. would love to just have the audience hear everything. Let, let's do that. It's a, it's a great start. So, so I grew up in the suburbs of New Delhi in India. Um, you know, I grew up in a very humble family. So me and my brother, I lost my father to cancer when I was about two years old. A uh, single mom worked super hard to give me and my brother a good education. Um, but I do feel that having this tough background helped me give some opportunities or helped me strive for some opportunities that got me to here. Uh, one of the things we had to do early on was start working. Um, and uh, just being very entrepreneurial in the beginning, I always wanted to see what what is the easiest thing I can do that can get paid us the most. <laughs> That's something me and my brother would do. It's I, it's interesting the um, you know how that entrepreneurship in some regards is driven out of necessity when there isn't a job opportunity, right? And it sounds like that's kind of what you were doing growing up. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like yeah. what you're saying is that the adversity can drive a lot of innovation, and also yes. that grit can develop that grit, which is needed for entrepreneurship. Absolutely. So, so much better put than what I said. Yes, you, you nailed it. <laughs> no, that's perfect, Mike. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so I, I had this opportunity to start le- learning how to code at about 10, because uh, my brother was picking up coding. He's my older brother, and he was getting projects. And, and I was very intrigued. I was like, wow, people want to pay a lot of money for software development. <laughs> so yeah. that's kind of how I got into software and programming. Um, I built my first video game when I was 12 and, and never looked back. I've been coding ever since and, and really enjoy it. Um, when I was about 15 years old, that was the first time I went to a, a nice high school. Um, otherwise, we were just being uh, either homeschooled or, or doing local education. Um, this is one of the biggest high schools in New Delhi where I had the opportunity to meet my co-founder. Uh, and I know, Mike, you have a, a, a fun founder story. Everybody does, right? How you meet your yep. founders in the early team. Uh, but I had the opportunity to meet Samia. She was my co-founder for my first company and for the second company. Uh, but we both met in a coding class. There were about 170 kids 
and only three girls there. So she was one of them. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was kind of way back then. Uh, coding was not a popular option for girls. Now we have a lot of diversity and, and it's yeah. only getting better. Yeah, different nowadays. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Both of us were nerds, like class A nerds, we call ourselves. And, and we both, <laughs> both actually were fighting for the front seat. Um, uh, you know, she can, she kind of came in late. I already had a spot. And she was from that school. So she was like, this is my spot. Like, why are you in my spot? You know? <laughs> Ooh. All right. So, so it was a free seating setup then? Free seating setup. Yep. All right. Here, here's a random thing. I'm just going to take us off course for one second. One of the things yeah. I noticed in college is you had free seating and you would all plop down on your first day and have your seat. And then it's still open seating, but everyone settles into that one seat and you take it like the rest of the semester. And it's weird if someone takes your seat, even though it's open uh-huh. seating. Did you have that? Have you experienced the same thing? Oh, totally. We introduced this concept. Sounds like what you're saying is just kind of an open workspace or open school. Um, it is weird. We actually introduced that in our office and we had everybody take open spots because we were like, hey, let's foster innovation. You guys can sit wherever you want, collaborate. Oh, mm-hmm. And it, it didn't work because people find that one spot and that that feels like home and they don't want to move. <laughs> and then the, the creature of habit starts to kick in and you go to that same desk every day. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway, yeah. sorry to take us off track there, but. No, that was a great point, Mike. Yeah. So, so I met my co-founder like that. We both eventually became friends with what started. We both had a passion for coding. She's a rock star programmer. Um, 40 doctors in her family. She's the only software engineer. So, oh, wow. So, yeah. We, we both started coding on this project. Uh, that eventually became our first company. And, and one of the uh, big problems that India has is a female feticide or radiologists and healthcare professionals don't have quality software. I think that's a field that's, that's still evolving. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we worked on this platform called ETITI and, and we built this platform that was used by radiologists to just track their day-to-day work, track every reporting, but they, but they were able to also create this central database to track any high-risk cases um, um, uh, for usually lower income families is a preference of boys over girls. And it's obviously a huge problem in, in growing and developing countries. So we were mm-hmm. tracking those and making sure there's transparency with the government, with people, um, and we can educate people about equality. So, so that's what we did. And that's you're in high school? You're in, in high, high school, school during all this? Yeah, in high school during this. That is unbelievable. I know... Innovation in healthcare is really hard. In the in the United States, we have all kinds of required. HIPAA slows you down. You just can't do anything. Did you have, were there compliance things you were dealing with or was it like, we got to help people and here's the software? Yeah, com- compliance was, was an issue. It wasn't as bad as here just because there's more opportunity for software to come in. It's still in a new field. Like we don't have uh, electronic health record system. We don't have... Mm-hmm simple systems like you go to your doctor or physician and they can send your medicines to CVS like that. Right. Those simple mechanisms that we take for granted here are not built yet. Um, so there's, there's a lot more room for innovation and there's a bigger appetite for risk, uh, which is not here now. Right. Makes, makes perfect sense. And so, uh, so what ended up happening with that, uh, that business? Yeah. Great question, Mike. So, so we ran that company for about five years We were. I think 55 people towards the end, profitable business. Wow. Uh, had an opportunity to sell sell it to a healthcare company. Um, and it, eventually it was adopted by the Indian government. So that was a huge success for us. We feel socially we did a, a lot of good and, and monetary wise also, we all got to learn a lot, built a great, great team and had had a good exit. So, uh, and I was still told 21 at that time. So it was, it was a lot that happened in that, in that five years after high school. That's uh, that's an amazing story to do it at that age. So rather than, all right, so you built something in high school, you built a business during the years, most people would be in college. And then you came out of the back end with money instead of debt. And you probably learned yeah. a lot more than college, right? Well played. Very well played. I think you made the right decisions. I uh, appreciate it, Mike. I'm, I'm yeah. glad that this is, this is a podcast that's being recorded because I'm going to take it to my mother. Because when I was growing up, my mom, all she wanted for me was a job with health insurance and and every year and she still asked me i hope i hope you have health insurance right make sure <laughs> <laughs> priorities that's well, what she wants so. it's up to you as the founder whether you have health insurance or not right that's a decision you get to make i know and it's a hard decision right like what to pay yourself how get in health insurance or not because there's always opportunity to use that money 
to grow the company. So that's <laughs> a super, decision. okay. So we naturally landed on that. That's a super interesting topic, actually. How, how do you think about how you compensate yourself as an entrepreneur? And, and then I'll, I'll tell the Flowcast story. I'll tell, I'll tell you how we did it over the years. Uh, that's that's a hard question. So so for my first company, Mike, I was under the assumption, got to be hungry, got to use every single dollar that you're earning back in the business, want to make the product the best product. We're very engineering focused always. So we were like, <laughs> why yeah. are these salespeople taking commissions? We got to make sure <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, we don't need sales reps. We don't need marketing. We just need to build this amazing product and people should use it. You know, why not? So had that mentality yeah. of, uh, like not paying a lot of money to ourselves and, and growing with that outcome. And then eventually over the years, I've learned that it's nice to have stability. Like obviously the founders, I, I still feel that they shouldn't be the most expensive people because then I feel their priorities are not aligned in the company, but they should at least be paid market or close to market so that, um, uh, you know, the goal, the, the goal is never or rash decisions are never made out of being hu- too hungry right. um uh, so so that's been an interesting evolution but that's my thoughts what what are your thoughts mike how's the flowcast journey been for you so yeah we um i have same philosophy i don't want to bleed the company dry for a salary because that puts us in a position to go out of business and we're in it for the upside on the ipo or the exit right that's that's Absolutely. that's where from a financial perspective the real money comes so yeah i don't want to like take a higher salary to bleed the company dry so we just and as founders we have a theory where we we pay ourselves the same. So uh, Chris Ludy, our, our co-founder, chief product officer, Colin Zanstra, our CTO, we all make the same money. So we've just kind of given ourselves salary increases in lockstep. And for context, when we started the business, it was $1,000 a month was what we were making. So we thought about it like monthly up front. It's like, all right, I'm burning cash in my life and in our business. This is fun stuff. And then just kind of every time we'd raise and we felt like, okay, we could take a little bit more. Maybe it was 2000 all of a sudden, then it was 3000, then it was 4,000. Um, and then when we took on the bigger money from Insight Ventures, 25 million, um, you know, that's a bit more of a grown up organization. They are down to compensate CEOs in line with fair market value. So that's, that's exactly what it is. It's what, what's the fair market value for a CEO or a CTO or a CPO out there. Um, analyzing that. And then also recognizing like I'm a founder, I worked my way into this role. I'm not a public company CEO yet, so I shouldn't get a public company CEO comp. So you got to come through all that stuff. And where it ends up is, I mean, you're paid you know, pretty well, but you are not the highest paid employee at the company. That's for sure. I got to pay more to recruit executives. Um, but you end up getting to a point where, yeah, you can live more comfortably and you feel less stress in your daily life. So you can focus on the business more, which I always was in the you should be hungry camp. I was in that. And then finally had an investor be like, no, you got to pay yourselves more. So you're not stressing out about life. And it also happened to be right around when uh, my wife got pregnant and we were about to have our first kid. So that it's super helpful to not be stressed out at that point. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a journey and you just, at some point your gut will tell you it's time to go to fair market value. And that's sort of a life decision and a business decision at the same time. So Anyway, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting topic. Not many people chat about how that kind of progresses over the years. I think that's such a good point, Mike. And sounds like you also had that evolution where you guys started and, and great sounds like you had really good alignment with your founders where you all knew that you you all sent equal and that started with thousand dollars a month for everybody. And then once you either cross revenue milestones or investing or investment milestones kind of paid a little bit more a little bit more and and now it's closer to the fair market value it's obviously not as much as Satya Nadella would get paid or or a public company CEO would get paid um, because you always want to make sure you recruit the best talent and save that for them but also it's important for you and your family that they're not stressing out right to 100% completely agree nice I, I like that. I think I, I, we're very aligned there. I have very similar thoughts on how that should be. And and when I met my VC when we raised, they told me one thing, and and that's Bonfire Ventures, Mark Mullen there. If, yeah. if if we if if you guys. Oh yeah, he said he said no to my seed round. Yeah, great, great guy, great guy. He already passed on us, so, but great dude. Yeah. I bet he regrets it now. And uh, oh, he told to... me he goes. Uh, no, yeah, he he regrets it. I've talked to him since, and he's a great guy though. That's uh, that's awesome. You get to work with him. <laughs> yeah, but he told me one thing he was talking about um, this this concept of upside, making sure that when it's when you have an opportunity to sell the business, 
you're not that hungry that you make a rash decision and that's what you want because that can get you to some liquidity because I'm sure Flowcast has this massive goal and I'm, I'm, I know you'll get you guys will get there when you IPO. That's the end outcome you're seeking. So whatever that's a, can get you through those years. That's an awesome point. So it's basically like you shouldn't have the feeling of, oh, I got I to gotta pay rent next month and as such, I'm going to sell the whole company and blow this up. Yeah, that makes, that's a, that's a really good point from him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you got a good investor there. Well, well done. <laughs> Let's keep it rolling. So you sell your yeah. company. It ends up being implemented by the government in India. It's insanely impressive for a high school student to be doing that. So, all right, let's keep keep going with the story. Yeah, it was fantastic, Mike. It was great experience. Um, I think once once I got done, um, I, I got a lot of pressure from my family. It's come from a very humble family, so they were like, you know, this is this is like. Uh, and, and I don't know, I don't know how you come from, but I come from a family where no one has done or heard about entrepreneurship. Everything is about go find a stable job where you can work for 40, 50 years, never leave, retire, you know, get your 401k. So, so my, my, so, my example was uh, get a job for a little while, learn about stuff and then go start your own company after that. So that was, that was how both of my parents approached, uh, approached <laughs> nice. life. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. Good, good balance there. Sounds like. Um, so yeah, so I, I did that for a little bit. I actually joined a company called PricewaterhouseCoopers. Yeah, I, I worked there. I did some consulting. It was really fun. It was different experience. I got to learn a little bit more about sales. I've always been a developer and, and programmer, so that was that was interesting. So what type of um, consulting? Because most of our audience is going to know PwC as the big the big four accounting firm doing audits. Yeah. And and what what role were you in? Oh man, it's a, it's amazing, Mike. A lot of these, um, and I work with tons of CFOs. I know that's kind of the audience you work with too. Yep. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't know about is that these big four, like uh, and even Accenture and, and other KPMG, they have a lot of tech consulting and and they get, uh, just I'll, I'll give you a funny example. I was reading somewhere. Uh, what, what we do is we specialize with going in and auditing companies, going in and looking at the tech infrastructure, looking at where data is stored, how decisions are made, um, how people are compensated. Um, but then there's, there's a lot of things that happen just in the tech realm. And then we can come in and make suggestions on solutions and, and frameworks that people should be following and help them help companies implement it. So it could, it could range from anything from implementing and rolling out Flowcast, also training people on Salesforce. Um, and another interesting thing I was reading is Accenture's uh, Salesforce training arm and Salesforce arm has, has a net revenue of 15 billion a year, which is like approximately similar to how much Salesforce annual Whoa. recurring revenue is. Whoa, and- <laughs> all right, well, well done on their part, all right. Yeah, so that was really interesting. I didn't know that and I always thought that, that these firms uh, don't do much in tech, but that's kind of the role they play is because they have they already have penetration in these big companies and and helping them change management, adopt software was something that that I would I was in charge of. Yeah. And so, OK, I know I think a lot of entrepreneurs would have a hard time going back to a, a real job, I guess is how we could call it. What was yeah. that transition like for you? I mean, you go through this exercise of scaling a company to 50 people, you're overseeing it, and then you sell, and then you go back to get a, a job. You know, a job is that? Did you enjoy it? Did you learn, or was was it hell for you? Uh, great question, Mike. I, I think I bought a lot of energy, um, and I feel there was a lot of entrepreneurial energy that I that I got in. Uh, I think the hard part was just like following direction and and <laughs> that, that's and, what i'm yep and kind of staying in my lane i think that was really hard for me to digest you know i was like why can't i talk to the ceo why can't i question thing how things are done um and and i feel those those are things that i would definitely if i were to go back into a regular job or, or any job i would i would do better but i feel there's a lot of these aspects of being gritty and not accepting failure being innovative trying to problem solve uh, just working well with others, understanding people's motivations, um, and getting work done is, I feel, can be applied to any environment, and and that's yeah. what was beneficial. Uh, but just that this aspect of that never, never trying to hear no and <laughs> and trying to just piss people off <laughs> was yeah. things that I would not do again. <laughs> well, it's it's hard to turn off the entrepreneurship, but it's it's good. You know, my my take working in a big company is good. You learn a lot about how what it's like to be an employee, the politics that go on, how to work the game, the staying in your lame concept, all that. And as an entrepreneur, it's important to know about that because you're 
employees are dealing with that and that stuff might start to creep up as you scale. So I, th- I think it's really helpful to work inside of a company and see what the real world is like be- either before or between, you know, starting companies. So mm-hmm. any other, like any big lessons out of PwC that you think helped you as you move through onto your next venture? I, I, that's a great question. I think, I think just working with such a big company, it was, it was really humbling to, understand their journey and and what got them there you know there was a lot of talk about not using the best software or not not being the best at it but i'm sure a lot of your audience and a lot of your people you work with or who buy your software they really respect and value their job even though they're not maybe using or getting to use the most innovative stuff and and saying yes to everything that's happening um, I worked with people who have been there for 30 years, 25 years, and, and a lot of time. And that kind of was really inspiring, that that kind of loyalty that you have towards a brand and the company mm-hmm. was was just very inspiring to see. And I feel I kind of crave that, and, and you crave that sometimes. And I'm sure you have your top people at Flowcast who have been there with you through everything. And and, you, and no matter no matter how good or bad they are, you just have a certain level of respect for them to see see and be with you through the tough times. And I feel, I feel that was something that I, I really enjoyed seeing that was inspiring. Yeah. And I'm sure the early, the, the employees who were willing to take a risk on you and you know, risk years of their career to come and try to make it happen with you are so special and so impactful and such a big part of the journey. I, um, yes, we do. Uh, we, grant everyone a physical vest when they hit their four-year vesting time frame. So we do a company announcement to give a vest and nice. I cry while announcing those. <laughs> that is like how powerful it is and how, how much it means to me that someone took a risk and has been with us for four years at this point, you know, we've existed for six. Wow. So yeah, like that can't be understated. That is super important. I'm sure you have customers who started paying $10,000 or $5,000, but six years ago that, that are still with you. I'm sure they're as special as the big account. Oh yeah. The clients are, that's yes. Clients and employees, it's all, it's all very important. You think back to those days and the the risk, it means a lot. And that's, that's what makes your company, right? It's, you know, some of the people who took a risk on you, it's a huge part of it. You can't do this stuff by yourself. It's about building a team. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, perfect. I'll, I'll keep going. So, so just a little bit, you know, journey on into this company here, Mike. So, um, uh, as as a big company person, it's kind of hard. Once an entrepreneur, it's kind of hard to give that up easily. And and we were itching with what to do next. Um, and and for this next company, me and my co-founder got back together. Um, we we started our our first segment of the business, which was a community product. And our goal was: can we get employees together and and help them feel like that they belong together in a group? So mm-hmm. it was a, it had a lot of communications feature, a lot of community features, and that that was kind of lessons learned from uh, my big company experience. And then Sami, my co-founder, was working with a big company at that time, um, and she had she had made her way to the U.S. She was doing her master's at UC Santa Cruz, so I kind of okay. pushed her away from it, and, and we, got, <laughs> we both got back together. Um, and and recently, when COVID hit, one of the things we were seeing, and we we've always been very customer obsessed, uh, very similar to you, Mike. And we work a lot with our customers, make sure that they're happy, they're using the platform. Um, one thing that we always, that, that we're frustrated about was that a lot of innovation is happening in sales and marketing. Uh, so we wanted to build something that we could use to innovate with customer success. And, and that's kind of the journey to this platform where uh, we had built something internally where we would take different aspects of our customers and basically the revenue they've been spending with us, what's the retention rates, how often do they use the product to spit out a score and tell you how healthy the customers are. Okay. And we decided to launch this platform. Uh, so that was kind of the, the, the origins of this company. It was through a, a decade of learning of how important customers are and, and making sure um, how can we help other founders and other companies be more customer obsessed. So, all right, I want to be totally clear. So what you're, what you have today is software that you built to help solve that pain point at your prior or with your prior product. Mm-hmm. So was it, was it like you, you had built something and then you go, okay, I need something to track churn in the back end. So you had an internal tool that you use for that. And then you were like, this internal tool is super valuable. Let's spin it out and start selling it. That's exactly what we did. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, um, obviously we didn't plan it that way as, as you know, with entrepreneurship, 
you start somewhere, you get market feedback, you have to pivot, you have to adapt. That's kind of what happened with us too. So we, yeah. we were using something internally and, uh, and uh, we built something that we felt can be more valuable than what we have. So we started to productize, productize this. Well, that is the Slack story. So hope it works out the same way for you. Slack has done pretty well for themselves. <laughs> uh, you know, Salesforce, what was it? 28 billion. And maybe, maybe you uh -huh. one day will fit in the Salesforce portfolio as well. feels like you guys mm -hmm. might be tangentially related, but yeah, Slack was an internal built product. They were doing something else and then realized, Hey, this communication tool is awesome. Right. And rolled it out from there. And, and it sounds like, sounds like you, you guys use Slack and you're a big fan, fan of Slack too. I, I was, I was hearing yes. that. Um, <laughs> one of the analysis we were doing yesterday and I was sitting down with a few CEOs and, and CFOs of companies we work with, um, Slack had about 800 million in annual revenue when it was bought for about 27.7 billion. That's about 30 times its annual revenue. Uh, similarly, Zoom is now trading at 40X its annual revenue. Yeah. And both of these companies um, um, have really high, really low churn, like 1% or less churn and they have really high net retention. Um, whereas some other companies, like we were looking at Box and Zora and Domo, these are very iconic SaaS companies, uh, but, but we were seeing that they're only trading at 3x to 5x because they have, they have high churn. So churn okay. is such an important thing to track and, and uh, beloved products like Slack, like they have low churn and they have like massive valuations, right? That, that was very interesting to see. Um, it, yeah, I mean, churn is, it's, in, in the spotlight so much. And I feel like over the last five to seven years, it's become even more important. Correct. You know, correct me if you, if you disagree, but when I, when we talk about fundraising and valuation and drivers, it feels like, you know, in the private market, it's certainly not a, it's not a totally free market. It's a weird negotiating uh, area, but it feels like the most important things are top line ARR growth rate, and then net revenue retention. I mean, that's it. Those are the three and like net revenue retention is one of the biggest drivers in understanding if you're going to scale as a company, because that's how you get the cheapest revenue. Yeah. Right. So having something like what you guys build is just so important for a business to help grow and maximize valuation. Like literally, I'm sure you have a nice ROI pitch around. We can actually add to your enterprise value if you use our software here. <laughs> we, we actually don't, but, but I'm going to write it down. So All right. <laughs> there you go. Free, free one for me. I would make big claims. Like we can add a billion to your market cap if you use us, something like that. <laughs> I like that, Mike. Thank you. And, and yeah. you guys have done such a good job with just managing your customers so well. You know, I've, I've and we, we're in the same circle. I talk to a lot of the VCs who have who have Flowcast as their biggest logo on their front page, and oh, you know, nice. they talk about you know this is these are the formulas you guys need to follow. This is what you this you need to do what Flowcast has been doing in order in order to be as big as them. Oh well, that's awesome. All right, I guess we're we're making it a little bit in LA here, and you're you're also in you're in Los Angeles as well, right? Yeah, Santa Monica. That is cool. Great. Oh, good, good decision. And then I do, I have to ask, you know, I see you did the old Harvard dropout thing. That seems to be the rite of passage for a lot of, uh, a lot of engineers. Is that, <laughs> tell me about that. That, that, that's, a, uh, you know, that's, that's really interesting. I, I put that as like a, a benchmark a few years ago, uh, decided and, and haven't taken it out. Like if I were to do it again, I'd probably not put it, but but my brother went to Harvard, and, and it was really special for him because, because you know we come we come from a, a humble family, and it was really big big for for them. He kind of gave me a lot of like formulas of like how to get in, and I followed a lot of those. So I feel okay. <laughs> it was it was really helpful for me to do that. But I never wanted to go back to grad school, so I, so I did 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 it. I actually switched to an extension program for a few weeks and decided not to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and about six years ago, when I thought it was super cool, I put it on my LinkedIn to make it, make it sound special. <laughs> well, the, about... uh, the Harvard dropout is a classic entrepreneur story. So I think that's probably a good <laughs> one to leave on your, leave on your list there. I want to, um, I want to wrap it up with one, one final question, you know, the, so your second time building a business, what have you done different the second time around? And, you know, what advice would you give your first time founder self? Ooh, that's a, that's a great question. I, I would say, um, uh, what have, what have I done different is just, just kind of learn a lot about people skills. Um, and, and that's, that's been really good. I think, I think as a first time founder, I'm very product obsessed. Uh, but ultimately yeah. if I look back at the journey, I feel it was people that made that product. So, um, you know, uh, Bill Campbell, who's like the Silicon Valley coach, he was Steve Jobs coach. He talks about it's 
people, products, and profits. So I feel that's, that's been my motto this time. It's focused on the people. Just make sure you get the best people. They're happy. They love working here. Um, um, similarly with our customers, treat them right. Do the best job possible. Then focus on the product. And the third would be then focus on the profits. And I think I think that's been kind of a new newer learning for me to learn. Uh, like you were saying, right, some time ago, you were talking about that it's important to kind of put yourself in, in shoes of a big company because you need to understand how your employees might be feeling. I think that's a really important thing is to be transparent, figure out the issues that are happening, get get those out of the way for your people. Um, that's That's been a new and interesting learning for me as a, as a second time founder. Yeah, transparency, huge, right? It can be mm-hmm. difficult conversations, but employees appreciate knowing what's going on. And I know, mm-hmm. I know when I was working, I appreciated that transparency. In terms of like, managing or leadership, any sort of tactical advice on that, on that front, things you've changed? Yeah. One-on-ones. Um, I love those and I would, you know, go back and do them and hope every org does them. I'm sure you have one-on-ones with your VPs or senior yep. staff, right. Um, and, and in, I'm encouraging them to do it and so forth. I feel one-on-ones have been really special for me because it's really important to a manage people's motivations, um, but also just delegate tasks better, listen, get feedback real time. I think I think those have been game changing for me. I would never do those before. I'd be like, talk to me on Slack or email yeah, me and yeah. I'll take care of it. Uh, but I've, I've come to see that one-on-one can be the best tactical tool for any any leader. There, um, I'd love to know, do you have a, a format for running them or I am super informal. It's just like, Hey, what's up? Let's talk. There's nothing behind my one-on-one. So do you have a, like any sort of structure you use or is it like that? I do use the structure, but you know what, whatever, I think it's whatever works best for you. No, there's, there's no, there's no right way for it. Yeah. There's no there's, right for it. For yeah. it right. Cause, cause your people might be so used to doing that, that they already know what they want to talk about once you pop that question. I always start with a, something called a trip report, which is just an informal report building thing. Um, like we started today, you were talking about the Georges. That was really fun. You know, I got to, got to yeah. know you a little bit better. Uh, start a little bit with that, but then it goes into what they have in mind. So I always ask for an agenda in advance, saying like top three or four things you want to talk about. Um, I always then ask for some feedback. So it's feedback that they are giving to me or to the okay. org. Um, and then I flip the script. So then it's about here are the three things I want you to focus on or things that that I want to give you feedback on. So it's both. It's like you understand their perspective, what they're working on, issues that they have, and then you give you give them courageous and cap- compassionate feedback. So that's the script I follow. Obviously, yeah, everything is different and it changes. You know, every week can be different in a startup. No, that's that's a great format. And how how long are those meetings? And how frequently do you have them? Uh, I've experimented a lot. What works best for me are thirty minutes. Um, and I only do it with four or five people um, every time. So so I try to limit them to four people in, at any given period of time. Um, and I do it once every week for 30 minutes each. Okay. Um, my co-founder does it very differently. She likes to do it with her engineering leaders and product leaders. She likes to do it 45 minutes once every two weeks. Um, and she does it on a rolling basis so where she does one. And then then... If there's follow-up topics, then they decide when the next one should be, which is like oh, a, okay. a different philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's... How do you, how no, do, you do that, Mike? Mine is... Um, so I meet with my uh, direct reports on the executive team and then um, some other, you call them, you know, skip meetings. You kind of go down a level and chat with some people. And it's it's generally like longer tenured Flowcast employees. So some of the, the nice. old school people who, you know... One of the things I really respect about uh, them is they will tell it like it is. I'm not like Mike, the CEO to them. I'm just the guy who's been working with them for six years at this point. So I get super honest feedback and a lot of, you know, a lot of transparency about what's going on. But for me, it's weekly for my direct reports every other week or, you know, maybe once a month for for other folks that I chat with. Um, and it's an hour and crazy informal. It's literally like, like, hey, what's up? How's it going? I might have some topics I want to talk about and it might go an hour. It might go. 15 minutes. If it's only 15 minutes, that's great. We get 45 minutes back and get to work on stuff. Um, so you have a very different approach. I'm sure mine are not as effective as yours for sure. Um, but not much of a process guy, believe it or not. So I like them more. I like them less formal. No, but that's great. It feels like you really enjoy talking to the people who've been there for a long time. So you can get the candid and most 
most kind of honest feedback on what's going on, right? Like the ground, ground level truth, right? I don't know how, how you feel about this, but I always respect employees who tell me like it is and will tell me the bad stuff rather than sugarcoating. And you can always tell when someone's sugarcoating something, right? Like, you know what's yeah. going on. Do you, have you noticed that changing as you kind of have, have scaled your company? And how do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. And, and I feel it's almost like how you take that feedback. Um, a, you're absolutely right. Like, sounds like the people who can tell you how it is are very valuable. 100% agree. Like, yeah. no, no, no two ways about it. Um, I do feel that as you take that feedback and how you take it, if you're, if you approach it the right way, and if you are, you know, almost like as a, as a founder in your body language, you know, what's going on. Um, if you can do a good job, I feel others want to speak up to, uh, but if you shut them down, then others don't want to speak up to. So that's kind of what I've seen. I feel, I feel I'm better, better with feedback, <laughs> you know, before I was, when I was at least growing up, or I would say when I was younger in my 18, 19, 20 or earlier years of the company, I would always, uh, you know, you could see in my face, I'm, I'm, I'm mad about this. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm mad that I'm mad about the fact someone brought it up in a, in a big meeting. <laughs> and, and then, and then if you get mad, it's not going to motivate the person to want to bring anything else up. And then you kind of exactly. get into a vicious cycle. And then cycle. no one else wants to do it because then everybody is like, oh, the CEO gets mad every time. Why, why do we want to, you know, so that's been interesting. That's been some learnings there. Well, how, how have you handled that? Have you seen that as Flowcast keeps growing? Have you? seen that when you, now that you're a bigger bigger team dude i i know i learned something from you right now i think i might not always have the perfect response to negative feedback <laughs> and so i might i might be discouraging others from speaking up that way um so yeah i might i might have some self reflecting to do here and see if i can work on how i how i approach that to encourage more more transparency from everyone mm. nice you great feedback i love that yeah this is a <laughs> it's been super valuable for me <laughs> nice. i like it i like it all right. Well, let, let's wrap it on that note. You, you taught me something on the podcast. I love it. That was super helpful. Uh, it's perfect, Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed the conversation and uh, excited to see what you what you guys have going there and, and everything you're launching. I keep up with your product updates. Um, I recently actually copied a, a, a really good ROI analysis that you did. At, and I, I made my, I got it. Nice. And I told my team. This is what we need to do. We need to use how Flowcast build it. We got to do the same <laughs> amount of work because it. You put it so so perfectly. You talked about the operation efficiencies and productivity. Talked about kind of the bottom line savings. I was like, oh, this these guys know what they're doing. <laughs> there you go. Take it. Enjoy it. Don't reinvent the wheel. You might as well roll something forward and and use yeah. it. Yeah. I'm glad glad we could help. Uh -huh. Well, thank you so much for joining today. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed the conversation and uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for your time. Talk to Thanks, Gaurav. Really appreciate it.